Welcome, everybody. Uh, I am delighted to see that we have a full room of experts and uh, uh, people with plenty of experience in government and, and business for this session on the global security outlook. Let me first say how happy I am to sit in the middle of what I think is a really outstanding uh, group of panelists. Uh, we will be discussing the question of what's ahead? What um, is in the view of this group of panelists and uh, in the view of all of you, uh, the biggest challenge lying ahead in 2017? But there are usually also opportunities. So if uh, we can think of large opportunities for peace and progress and uh, crisis management, we should not forget those. So let me very briefly start by introducing my, my, my panelists. And I'll do it in the order in, in which we will be speaking in just a moment. Uh, I'll start with Shirley Ann Jackson sitting over there. Uh, Shirley Ann Jackson. Uh, has such a long list of um, professional and honorary functions that I need to be really selective. She was, for a while, the chairman of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the 1990s. She was the co-chair, importantly, of the U.S. President's Intelligence Advisory Board during the Obama uh, period. She has been since 1999, president of the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, which, as you told me, is the oldest uh, institution of that kind in the United States. And she has served on any number of other institutions, including, of course, Brookings and the Smithsonian, uh, and so on and so forth. So it's probably hard to find a nuclear physicist by training with such broad uh, political experience. To her right, since my good friend Nicolas von Bommhardt. Nicolas von Bommhardt has been uh, an extremely successful uh, CEO of one of Europe's leading insurance companies, Munich Re. Munich Re has a global reach, and uh, Nicolas has led uh, this company as uh, chairman since, for more than a decade, since 2004. He is planning to uh, step down now, um, and we hope that we will see more of him in the discussion of black swans and, and what's happening in the future. Because Munich Re has, of course, as a reinsurance company, has spent a lot of time and energy thinking about how to define and how to measure risk and how to make sure we don't have too many unforeseen uh, surprises. Uh, now, on my right, uh, somebody who, in this uh, Davos forum, doesn't need much of an introduction. C.P. Livni has been, roughly speaking, for the last 15 years, but ending a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. a member of practically every Israeli cabinet, serving as foreign minister for a number of years, uh, serving as minister of justice, leader of the opposition, minister of agriculture, minister of regional cooperation. In other words, one of the most experienced Israeli politicians. So welcome to you, uh, Zippy. And, and last not least, uh, the president of the Japan International Cooperation Agency, uh, Professor Shinichi Kitaoka, who uh, uh, has a PhD from the University of Tokyo, mm -hmm. who served as ambassador and deputy perm rep of Japan to the UN, uh, somebody with enormous uh, global and political and academic experience, professor at the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies at the International University of Japan. Welcome to you, sir, also. so. Uh, Let's take three, four minutes, each of you, uh, please, to tell us what you think uh, this year will bring in terms of more um, crisis, uh, more uncertainty, or maybe opportunity. And if you could, uh, 
if you could spend a moment on the question of why has it become so hard to try to predict things? <coughs> uh, and I will just very briefly share with you my own experience. Each year, at this moment, beginning of the year, we try very hard as we define the uh, agenda for the Munich Security Cons. We try very hard to ask every smart person we know in Germany, in the US, in Russia, in Brussels, everywhere, to, to make sure we don't overlook something. In early 2014, three years ago, I tried very hard to make sure I was on top of things. None of my smart friends was able to tell me that I should put on the agenda the problem, the challenge of ISIL. Uh, six months later, every citizen in, in the Western world knew that that was going to be the biggest challenge. So why didn't we see that at the beginning, at least we at the policy level? That same moment in January, we failed to see that what was happening in Ukraine was not, not going to remain a local problem, but it might actually explode into the single biggest security challenge for Europe, for greater Europe, in, um, in more than two decades. So this has been really uh, extremely challenging. So you're first, uh, Shirley. Tell us what you think. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. I think I'd like to talk about how I see the greatest challenges, but embedded in them is in fact my answer to your question about why we don't foreshadow them better than we do. And that has to do with the fact that because of the interconnectedness of, of our systems and societies, the main risks turn out to be global, yes, but the real point is that they are networked across domains, and I'm going to come back to that. And each uh, global challenge impacts others. And so, for instance, people talk about climate change. And I'm not going to talk about climate change in the usual sense, but think about what can influence national and global security. For example, uh, vast resources of petroleum, natural gas, and mineral wealth is in the Arctic, being made accessible by melting sea ice. And so there's a likelihood that that will cause new geopolitical tensions. Uh, and as you know, Russia has the longest uh, border uh, in that region. But then there are things that are linked in ways where the, if there's a triggering event, the vulnerabilities are intersecting, and so there can be cascading consequences. Now, one that we know about and people talk a lot about because of the focus in cyber has to do with the distributed denial of service attacks because of the insertion of the Mirai virus through you know, relatively really unprotected uh, connected devices the, the, through the so-called Internet of Things. But then that same kind of attack disrupted Liberia's limited Internet uh, uh, infrastructure and a Mirai attack on Deutsche Telekom in December of 2016 uh, cut off phone and Internet connection to 900,000 people. I was a victim of that. Mm. I think we were, many of us were victims of things, at least you admit them. <laughs> <laughs> and then one that I particularly have a concern about, having been the chair of a nuclear regulatory commission, has to do with the compromise of critical infrastructure that might make use of digital um, industrial control systems, so-called SCADA systems. And uh, I could go on, including the fact that uh, there were power outages in uh, 2015 in Ukraine that uh, were caused by apparently coordinated remote cyber attacks on three power stations. So, you know, there's the point that if something happens, you can take down a whole electrical grid. But one that I actually talk about is one that one may not expect, and that had to do with the uh, earthquake subsequent tsunami and that triggered uh, the accident at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant and caused a meltdown. But in doing that, it took out a, a huge amount of infrastructure and affected manufacturing, not just in <coughs> Japan, but globally and supply chain. So 
if you think then to, about the answer to your question about why we can't predict these things, when you have human and man-made infrastructure and activity that intersects with uh, things that are inherently unpredictable, then those things allow us not to be able to be predictive, but they also, interestingly enough, create opportunity for additional mischief. So if I think then about your question, I would say that what makes some of this difficult is the very pace of technological change, where many of our policy frameworks, our legal frameworks, how we cooperate have not caught up with the fourth industrial revolution. That each one of us, and each can remain me a person, a government, or business, operates under our own assumptions about globalization and the power of technology, but through the lens of our domain. And so we operate in our own domains. And there has been, although I think forums like this are very important, uh, more limited information exchange, including sometimes intelligence. Hmm. And then some of these things are slow building. And so part of the difficulty with climate change is just that. But when it's upon us, it's a crisis. So that's my early response to your question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So if you are tempted to ask a question or offer a comment, don't forget it. We'll get to all of you, but only after completing this first round. Nicolas from Baumhardt, yeah. you're next. Thank you, Wolfgang, also for the introduction. First of all, I have to state I'm not a politician. I'm a citizen, and I'm maybe a businessman, and that's my perspective on the question. I will sort of fill in on what you said, Shirley. First of all, I would say, and this is something you have heard here several times, that the level of un uncertainty is unprecedented, and that is no question to all of us. Maybe when the Iron Curtain came down, that was the moment of the World War II that is comparable, but after World War II, this is probably the epitome of it. And that comes at a high cost to societies. If you prepare for so many different scenarios as an enterprise, we know it's costly. It will go at the cost of the margin, and certainly that goes for societies too. It is not very efficient what we experience right now. So we still have not really found a way to tackle the old issues, I might call them demography. We have shrinking societies, we have proliferating societies, both creating their own issues, and at the same time you mentioned climate change, both of course also triggering a wave of migration. Serious issue, not tackled really yet. Pandemics have been discussed here also in, on the conference, a very serious issue. At the same time, we have certainly among Western societies a sort of a, a consequences of discrediting the society, the value of those societies, which makes it very difficult for politicians also to <laughs> act. The, the trust sort of is in, in danger, in, in question at least. The values are being questioned. Inequality is the topic, but only one. Most, most say that is a consequence of globalization. I don't share that view, by the way. And as a further consequence, of course, then you many think, citizens, that politics practically failed. There is, Germans always say there's an erosion of law because politics cannot act within the framework they were used to to tackle what they have to tackle. And the further consequence is then sometimes lack of enforcement of what should be enforced. And all that means to me that the tool set of politics to tackle what we have out there apparently doesn't really work anymore. When I come to the question of prediction, and of course here I feel more comfortable, I admit it, it's, it's about the interconnectedness and the complexity. There's no question to us, and we see it when we work, for example, with supply chains, it's, it's a real, luckily we have the computing power today to, to do something about it, but it's very, very difficult to find out who is connected to what and what will that mean. And in a world as fragile as today, of course, it doesn't take much to flip something. <coughs> You know, the butterfly phenomenon, now we have it. It's so fragile, it doesn't take much. And the conflicts that we see if I stay in the political arena are multi-layer. If you take Syria as an example, it may have started like an issue of rich and poor. It turned into an issue 
of minority majority, it turned into an issue of a religion, it turned into a question of who is the hegemon in that area, it turned into a proxy war between Russia maybe and US and God knows what. It's so many layers that the political kind of tool set doesn't seem to work. And the another thing why it is so difficult to predict, as I mentioned already, that question of a single event can change everything, right. is of course too many involved. In the years before 89, it was a relatively clear set world. Practically two, maybe three powers of relevance and you knew who to call to solve the issue, who to call today. And last in that, uh, as regards prediction, is the question of speed, communication. Everything is so fast. And, and you know that argument. I'm always a little bit uh, kind of uh, worried or startled if politicians come with a famous black swan. Because the black swan practically is a real tail event. That means very unlikely, hard to predict. And that word is used so many times. And this, we know that in Western Australia there are many black swans, <laughs> but there are way too many right now in that discussion. And I think if politics and could to some extent, cautiously worded, learn from industry in that regard in applying what we call integrated decent risk management that goes across the divisions of politics per country, writing a risk report, for example, and then do what you can prepare for because you know it might come. Then at least you are prepared for that what might come and there's still enough out there that you could not prepare for. But if you don't do the first step, you're in a miserable situation. Doesn't sound too encouraging. No, I'm a ranger and I'm defo uh, professionally deformed. <laughs> <laughs> I admit that. <laughs> we'll go right over to you, Zippy. You have a view that's not American and not uh, uh, European, but uh, from your part of the uh, world. Yeah, I think that we should understand that we know nothing about the future anymore. Uh, that you're talking about in terms of black swans, it's all over the place. I'm looking for the same old familiar white swan now. Yeah. And uh, things are changing and we need to understand it because I believe that we are judging things to come in ancient tools. And uh, um, everything is changing on one hand. I, I feel like watching a movie in a fast forward man manner, a kind of a science fiction uh, movie with all this technology that I'm not familiar with, which is good because it makes our life easier and everything, but it is changing everything. It is changing our values. It is changing uh, uh, where the power is. You were talking about, you, you said you are not a, a politician. It's not that big deal to be a politician these days. Uh, the power is uh, in the people's hands. Uh, it is changing the press. Where's the power? Is this the media or somebody who can text something in, in Facebook or tweet something and can change the world? This is on one hand. So it's like, as I said, a science fiction movie, something from the future coming to us. But on the other hand, since you mentioned ISIS, this is a religious war like hundreds of years ago with the same cruelty, cutting heads off. I mean, you have this old technology and in the end they are cutting heads off. And I think this, that what happened is that the modern society didn't know how to handle this with this. And in most places, they discover that they, that, that they are losing. In a way, ISIS succeeded in harming our own values. Because Europe discovered that what's happened in the Middle East, it's not in the Middle East anymore. And the refugees are not even in your backyard, it's inside your home. And those leaders that try to make you know the same old <clears throat> democratic, uh, according to a ve their values decision, discover that they are being judged by the people as being naive, as uh, not uh, taking care of their own people or of their own citizens. So our values are being questioned. And this is the success of all these uh, uh, extremists that are against us because of who we are and are using eye technology to spread hatred. And what I said before we entered the room, you know, we need to understand that here in this room, I said that for the first time in my life, I feel old, hmm. that we are here, we are the establishment, that young people in the world hate. We are the privileged here. We are those that in a way we need to understand what goes underneath the surface. And it's, 
in this chain, I mean in an hour, a new American president is going to enter office and nobody knows what, what, what's coming next. And we need to understand it at first and not to try to, to predict the unpredictable. We need to understand that everything is unpredictable. And another thing which is very important, red lines are being crossed in terms of values, in terms of, uh, when I said that on the other, we have a technology, but on the other hand, we are going back also in terms of values. Liberal values are gone, not, not gone, but, but are being eroded. Mm. <coughs> And therefore, when any leader, I don't know, is crossing a red line or said the, the unsaid things or the unacceptable in one part of the world, it gives the legitimacy to another politician, another lad in the other side of the world. For him, this is a line that already was crossed. Mm -hmm. So for him, it's becoming the obvious. And this is the deterioration in which we are. And I believe, and I would end this, uh, uh, um, that there's a need for the liberal, moderate forces to unite and to give another vision. It is our own. I'm, I'm, we are not going to change our values. We need to fight for them. But we need to do it in a manner that creates interest for young people that for them it's something, it's a new vision. It's not the same old establishment preaching them or patronizing them, but something that they can feel that this can be part of their identity, that it's worthwhile to fight for. And last thing, of course, is cyber, that, that <clears throat> in terms of security, it's not anymore governments. Wars are not between governments and not even organizations, like terrorist organization somebody can turn off the light in, in another state just because he wants to. And we are not ready for it. In this happy note. <laughs> mm -mm. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Zippy. Dr. Kitaoka, your turn. Oh, yes. Uh, let me introduce, uh, uh, to, uh, to follow up your introduction of me. I had been a uh, uh, security advisor to Prime Minister Mini Abe for a few years. And then uh, uh, let me speak about the Eastern, East Asian situation, which I think is most dangerous today. And uh, one uh, uh, thing I can say is that there are something predictable and then something unpredictable. And then underlying factor was that if a country, sovereign country or a strongly uh, organized group is determined to do something, it's very difficult to stop from outside uh, because of the advanced technology, military technology. In <laughs> East Asia, uh, I'd like to say that uh, there is a delicate balance of security. Since 1971, when Kissinger visited China, and based on, uh, he just made a, uh, the theory that uh, China is one because the peoples of uh, both sides of the streets believe China is one. But nowadays, 3% of the Taiwanese people believe that they are Chinese. Otherwise, other people believe that they are Taiwanese. And also, uh, in, uh, uh, since the end of the World War, uh, the, there was concern about the Japan's uh, revival as a military power. So the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty was a kind of instrument to uh, be a cap for the bottle. And then uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, just tried to confine Japan's autonomy. And instead, uh, the, they had the uh, military alliance. And then uh, the uh, US uh, 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 had a basis, military basis in Japan, which are very much advantageous to them, like Sasebo, Yokosuka, and so forth, Okinawa. Uh, uh, as a result, Japan could concentrate on uh, economic activities, uh, but uh, never allowed, was never allowed to be independent military power. Now, uh, in 1994, uh, the, it was discovered that uh, North Korea was engaged in the military the, uh, nuclear uh, development. And then no one believed that that, that would continue to, to today. But actually, uh, almost all the specialists believed that they would collapse. But now uh, they have uh, uh, successfully developed nuclear weapons, and uh, they are successfully making it smaller so that they can shoot it. Then, then they can almost uh, successful in making an uh, ICBM. 
and also the uh, submarine launch, launchable uh, missiles is uh, within their side. Okay. Uh, then uh, Chinese military power uh, uh, was uh, quickly expanding. Uh, remember that uh, the 10 years ago, it was uh, smaller than Japan. Uh, the economic size is smaller than Japan. And then, but uh, along with the wonderful uh, economic development, its military power expanded, expanded, expanded. Now it's more than uh, several times of Japan. And then uh, in 2008, when the uh, US was uh, uh, facing the Lehman shock, and China became uh, very confident and began to uh, challenge our control over Senkaku Islands. And then later on, they are now expanding onto South China Sea. And then here comes Mr. Trump saying that the, uh, questioning the relationship between Japan and the United States is a fair relation or not. And certainly, uh, uh, Japan's you know, the ratio, percentage of Japan's military budget against GDP was one of the lowest among major countries. It's number one-tenth or so. So the, uh, there is, uh, it's not without reason that uh, Mr. Trump may question it. <clears throat> uh, but this is a delicate balance. Uh, Japan's basis, American basis in Japan is mainly to prepare for the uh, Korean Peninsula crisis. And then they have a privilege to make use of that. The, and also Japan is uh, 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 the supporting by uh, host nation support, which is bigger than South Korea or even Germany. But here, uh, Mr. Trump and uh, saying uh, in his election campaign, uh, as far as I remember, there was no American president or candidates who had ever not spoken about American values, freedom, democracy, or whatever. So the East Asian uh, prosperity and uh, stability was supported not only by American supreme, uh, uh, particularly on naval power, but also American commitment to the values of uh, freedom. Well, it is in danger, so that's why I believe uh, that this is the most uh, delicate uh, uh, timing uh, for East Asia. Thank you very much for, for drawing our collective attention to the situation in East Asia, because here in Europe, we often tend to think somewhat Eurocentric, uh, etc. Let me, before we turn to all of you with your questions and comments, uh, but let me just take up that point and, um, and ask a question first of you and, and, and of the others um, that is a variant on, on this. What do you think might be the first test for President Trump, who's going to be in office uh, in, in a few minutes, so to speak? Uh, is it likely, as some think, that that first test could actually be in East Asia, that it could have maybe not directly to do with China, but maybe with North Korea? Or what do you think? And what do you think? Uh, where is the first real challenge going to come from at a moment when this administration is not even fully staffed, probably doesn't even, not even know which button to push to get the telephone line, uh, this is a dangerous moment. So uh, tell us what you think. Well, it's all of the above, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> because I think one of the things that uh, the new president will confront straight away, and, and, but not in the way that, that it has been popularized in the press, but it is affected by that, and that is the relationship with Russia and the implications. Uh, in the Middle East. Secondly, I do think uh, not enough attention has been paid to Asia, particularly uh, East Asia. And North Korea is kind of the poster child of that. But uh, because of what has been articulated, uh, there's, there are some serious questions about the US relationship with China. And then, <clears throat> Then the rest of it falls in the black swan area. I don't, when people ask, well, what black swans will we face? They're not black swans if we know what they are. <laughs> you know. And um, so, so I think 
you know, that would be what I would say. But I do, if I can just take one minute here. Sometimes we should look more carefully for signs and put them together. Mm -hmm. So if we, we talk about the surprise in Ukraine, but if one looks back in the energy arena and look at the history of uh, Russian-Ukrainian uh, energy interactions, there have been ways that the Russians have been, uh, some would say, yanking uh, Ukraine to keep it, quote unquote, in line. Uh, we've seen it with basic energy supplies. Uh, we've seen it, as I talked about, with the recent attacks. But we also know the kind of ports that exist in Ukraine. And and so we should be able to put these things together and at least be on alert. That doesn't mean we can prevent them. And then if we look at a North Korea, and most people are concerned, uh, rightfully, about the weapons, the nuclear weapons. But frankly, 20 years ago, when I would travel around, there is a mindset about what confers power and prestige. And it's a mindset, particularly in developing <clears throat> and emerging nations. And it has to do with some, something that confers some military power. And so there's always been this high degree of interest in nuclear weapons around the world. Of course. But one could see it easily in North Korea. The real question becomes, <clears throat> What are nations collectively willing to do about it? And again, that's where you got to look for the signs, because people have interests and linkages to Russia. Could be with regard to energy, uh, important minerals, as well as business and economic ties more broadly. So I think we have to understand and be a little more mindful about these interconnections, as I said. We also have to think about, yes, technology gives a lot of power to the individual, and I call it the power of one. Yeah. But that reinforces the need, both in an educational sense, which is what I think about, but also in terms of what our leaders say and do about the reaffirmation of fundamental values but then to live there. I could go on, but I don't want to take <clears throat> too much. Thank you. Um, can I ask you to uh, try to come up with brief answers? We're quickly running out of time. Yeah. Nicholas? I have a, a short one only, and mm -hmm. I would like mm -hmm. to take up some that uh, Zibi said, and that's about the young and, and, and the leadership question, the vision question. I think this is key, too, and it's very difficult, and I really have to think hard about the personalities in political life who have both the integrity and the readiness in the sense of taking personal political risk to put something out, exactly. what they go for, and r explain it True. to the electorate and run the risk that they can't deliver and fail with that. Yes. There's very few out there. First of all, you have to have the integrity. That shrinks the group. Yeah, then two, you have to have, <laughs> of course, the acceptance in the political world. Mm -hmm. Smaller gets the group again. And then to have someone who really puts his head on a block, literally, mm -hmm. and says, I'm going for that, but mm -hmm. please rally behind my flag. Courage. This is where we want to go. Uh, I completely agree, and it, it would be also uh, nice if the vision would not be against something on somebody or group of people, but for something, yeah, yeah, yeah. and give something that people would feel that they can be united for something, and this makes them good, or they makes them feel good, and not just hate somebody else. And, and, and this, I believe, can be good news. Uh, asking about the new uh, president, I think that the test would be whether he's willing to wait a little bit before making decisions now. <laughs> and I would like to ask the new president a question. And I believe that this is the major question. What makes America great again? Because his vision is, let's make America great again. So what does he believe 
uh, makes America great again. Mm -hmm. If this is, and this relates to what you said, if this is about the American values, so it's great. From my perspective, uh, having a strong America is very good. America has a role in this world. The US is very important. So I would support this vision as long as all of us would understand what does it mean. Does it mean to be more involved? Does it mean to spread these values? Does it mean to work with uh, uh, more leaders, other leaders to act against extremism? All these things are yet unknown. And therefore, I hope that in the next few, I don't know, days, uh, uh, weeks, months, we would discover. And this can be uh, <coughs> not a black swan, but something that uh, maybe would even surprise for better, for, for good. Uh, against the nuclear, uh, North Korea. North Korea is uh, really, really willing to be recognized as a nuclear power. And also, they are willing to get the support, the guarantee of the regime by the United States. Uh, that they should not do that. Because if uh, the, uh, they are recognized as a nuclear power, then uh, you, we, you cannot stop the uh, armament of uh, South Korea. Because there are so many leaders that are proposing a nuclear armament. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's quite natural with the guarantee of the protection from the United States is ambiguous. If South Korea goes to nuclear, then it's uh, unstoppable in Japan to go to nuclear armament. Although, to, as of now, there's almost no politician who is arguing for nuclear armament still. But if the South Korea becomes a nuclear country, then it is quite possible for Japan to be a nuclear country. On South China Sea, uh, the delicate place was a Scarborough show near Philippines. And then US should continue the operation of uh, freedom to protect the freedom of navigation. Otherwise, if they stop there, even though China comes to uh, consolidate their uh, power control over the Scarborough Shore, then the, mm -hmm. it means that the, uh, their uh, control over the South China Sea becomes uh, consolidated. And then, then it's too late. Then the, there will be a domino by the Philippines and the Vietnam and so forth. U.S.-China is something that uh, is a huge question mark now. Of course. I mean, and to hear the president coming here, speaking about globalization here in Davos, the Chinese president. And uh, this is the moment to open it up. World. Uh, we don't have a lot of time because we are st stuck with this one hour. So I'm uh, looking around. Who would like to ask the first question or make the first comment? Sir, you have the floor, please. Please, <coughs> please. Uh, is there somebody with a microphone? Uh, uh, please be so kind and introduce yourself yes. and tell us whether you ask y your question of one member of the panel or of the entire panel. I will do that. Okay. My name is Atsushi Seike from Keio University, Tokyo, Japan. I have a question to Professor Kitaoka. I appreciate you mention about. Uh, East Asian situation. And my question is on uh, demography. Actually, the change of demography, which is one of the most predictable variables. Yeah. And uh, if you look at the demography in East Asia, all countries, I mean, uh, even China, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, are facing a serious aging population and low birth rate. And theoretically, you know, uh, population of these countries will be uh, disappeared within uh, several hundred years, <laughs> eventually. So I'm just curious to know your view on to what extent these uh, rapid shrinking uh, population uh, will have an uh, impact on the you know, uh, regional uh, security situation in the East Asia. Thank you. OK, we collect a few, and then we go back to the panel. There is a question from the gentleman here. Yes, Scott Asher from Oxford University, an artist international for Tsipi Livini. Uh, you mentioned the um, problem of youth. The problem is most governments in the world believe that young people, especially young men, are a problem. And their response is to clobber youth. Now how, what kinds of proposals exist to empower youth to let them commit to some kinds of values rather than going to places like ISIS? For we find that uh, with the defeat of fascism and communism, um, the quest for comfort and safety have become the principal values, and young people are not willing to sacrifice as they once were for values such as freedom and democracy. And in their place come groups that offer utopia and values that give adventure and glory. Thank you very much. Uh, there is 
uh, one more question here, and then you were second to last, and you're last. And then we have to close the list, I think. Please. Good afternoon, uh, André Pietri. I'm a technology investor. It's a question for Ms. Jackson. You talked about predictability. Uh, I was at a breakfast where artificial intelligence was seen as a way not to reduce costs, but as a way for companies to have an ultimate competitive advantage, which is to predict the future and reduce the risk. How much is this used in connecting the famous data points that you mentioned, which were appearing in Syria, which were appearing in Ukraine, and which have appeared for a long time in the South China Sea? Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. You are next, sir. First row here. Yes, Christian Bayer from Switzerland. Uh, taking into account that uh, nuclear technology is more and more accessible and will be more accessible, what rational and which criteria do you think should be used to select the countries which can have the technology and the ones which, where we should make sure they don't have access to the technology? Ah, great question. And the last question goes to the young lady here in the second row. Hello, Maha Salehi. I'm a global shaper from the Hub of Nice in France. I have two quick questions. First for you, uh, I would like to know who would present uh, Yemen in the Munich Security Conference, because no one is representing Yemen uh, in Davos <laughs> this year. And the second question goes to, um, to you. Uh, <clears throat> is there any chance that the, uh, the international community will make the relations between Saudi Arabia and Iran closer? Because I think... Um, <coughs> They have a very big role in the uh, stability of the Middle East. Thank you. All right. Now, uh, Philip, how much time now, uh, do we have left? OK. Uh, so I can give to each of you maximum of two or three minutes. And please be disciplined. Uh, that way, we will conclude uh, more or less in time. Shirley, uh, would you like to start? Sure. Um, <clears throat> well. The, the, let me talk to the AI question, the artificial intelligence. Um, yes, companies can have uh, competitive advantage, but it's a question of how they use AI. There are companies that use AI to connect the dots within their domains. The question is, how much do they use uh, those capabilities to connect the dots outside those domains? Now, I'm one who actually believes that you know, one needs to do a little bit more risk mapping, and I think uh, you spoke of that. And I think uh, artificial intelligence and the cognitive systems uh, actually have a pretty big and sophisticated role to play in that, but we don't have time to talk about it. On the, the nuclear question about selecting com countries that ought to have the technology, I'll just say there is a global nuclear framework uh, including the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and, and other related uh, uh, treaties and agreements. And again, it's a question of the willingness of the global powers in a multipolar world to actually uh, help to, to, to make that framework work. But it takes more time than we have. Thank you. Nicholas. Well, actually, I have not had a question to me, so I'm free <laughs> uh, in, in, in answering. And I, since I started on such a negative note, as you might say, I would like to end rather on a positive one. Mm -hmm. And the one was the leadership question. I think is a leadership moment for some, hopefully. Second is, and that may be part of your answer later to the question that came from that side, of course, it's about education, education, education. So if we can raise the level of education, then the positive side of science, the positive side of technology can solve many of the issues we talk about right now and avoid that people can be stirred up as easily as apparently they can do. And I must admit also we as businesses see a role for ourselves. We are, many of us here in Davos for sure, global companies. So even if politicians or their tools may not work all the time, ours pretty much work. And even so we are worried about many things, Trump, Brexit, you, a long list of things. Somehow we get around it. So by doing that, we may even support politics. And we think it should take an active part in that as a multiplier within the companies, which are global, but also in trying to contribute our fair share to the solution of what we discuss. Can, 
Can I, uh, before we go to you, Zivi, can I just um, go back one step and, and, and ask you to uh, tell us whether from your point of view as the leader of a large company that does a lot, probably spends a lot of time and energy and money uh, on risk assessing, risk assessment methods and hiring smart people to do that, do you think that there is enough um, discussion between your type of companies, for example, and government institutions? I mean, I wish I had Federica Mogherini here from the EU uh, uh, in order to tell us whether the processes we use, for example, in the EU foreign policy area to assess risks uh, uh, uses the same sort of due diligence that you uh, assess because in your case it's it's a, it's potentially about a lot of money. Yeah. Um, so how do we uh, hand? I don't know if we do it the same way, but I'm interested to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Also there is connection. So your answer is yes. Yeah, but I don't know if we follow the same methodology, mm. but we do it. Maybe we should organize a little uh, briefing session uh, for government and business. But one sentence only to that question. With the German government, we do discuss these I know. questions. I know. Yeah. And, and I know you want to go to the others, but I do feel I have to answer the young lady over here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, about uh, uh, the possibility of bringing Saudi Arabia and Iran closer together. I can't answer it. I'm, uh, I'm going to leave it to the real politicians. Mm. <laughs> but I will say that universities have a unique role because we do represent mm. and bring together the global village. And I think. It creates a, a place and a place of relative safety where, where this kind of interaction and development of understanding can go on. And that's precisely what we try to do. Uh, I think on, on this issue, I think that the world needs to choose. The international community needs to choose. I mean, uh, because it's not about the Saudis and Iran. And, and I said at the beginning, we are facing uh, also a religious war there. It's not the Islamic world against the others. It's also uh, between extreme Islamists and, 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 and more moderates or so. And, and, and this is something, in a way, when uh, um, <coughs> the world now relate to the situation as a matter of interest and the world's interest and abandoning some of the values that are important on, on, on these issues. And I believe that the choice of the free world is not between uh, the extreme uh, Shia uh, um, organizations or, or, the, or the, the extreme Sunna, but to work together against the, extreme, the extremists. And Iran represents something which is really danger. Uh, not just uh, as an ideology plus all uh, their uh, attempts and aspiration to achieve nuclear weapons. So this is something that needs to be addressed. And this is why I do believe that the role of the US is very important on this. Uh, uh, and the leadership of the US can be very important uh, and can affect the entire region, uh, as long as also other states in the region would understand that there is a leadership here that would take position and not just you know, trying to find out what is the interest of the US, Russia in the region and maybe split uh, the map of interest between, between them. Uh, you know, you, you, you said, I wish I had the answer to you, but basically when you said education, 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 and you were asking about young people, I start thinking about the Pink Floyd, so we don't need no education. This is the way young people feel. And I, I think that it is, not, it is more than that, and it's not only about governments. Their world, the, the, the young people's world, it's not in schools. It's in the social networks. And the social networks are being abused uh, in order to spread hatred. And we need to see how we are using uh, these networks in order to, sp to spread or to, 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 to have something which is different, which is what we believe in. Uh, as I said, we shouldn't change uh, our beliefs, but we need to wrap it in a manner that tells them that it is about them, not about us. It's about their future. Uh, and that we are willing to fight for it. Because what's happened during history is that, you know, young people are against the existing situation. And now maybe this is an opportunity to see, you see the trends, they are going the wrong direction. And it's going to, to affect your life as well, so let's fight together. 
And, uh, but we need to, to find a way to do it and to wrap it in a manner that uh, it's appealing to them. And as I said before, maybe I'm too old for this, but I think that this is something which is needed. It's an educational tool. Sorry? It's an educational tool. Okay. Which we have to Tippi, use. Yeah. Uh, before going to the professor, to, uh, on, on Iran, let me give you a 30 second uh, question, if you, if you could uh, give us a really brief answer. Given what you just said about Iran, does President Trump have a point when he talks about walking away from the Iran deal, or do you think we should stick to it? Well, I think the deal was done, but something is not in the deal, because the deal refers just to the nuclear uh, program. The deal doesn't relate to what mm. Iran is doing in the region. In different parts of the de uh, supporting terror, doing this and that. So in a way, uh, the well, without I think it, the intention was not to give it permission to say, okay, let's speak about uh, the nuclear stuff, and you can do whatever whatever you want. And now the world can say, okay, the deal was about your uh, nuclear stuff. Now we have we need to reach or to reach another deal or to stop you from <coughs> spreading uh, terror or financing terror in the region. And what worries me is that about the deal, the 10 years are nothing. Mm. And you know, it postponed, but yet would, what would be the day after the end of these 10 years? And this is something that we need to address now. Okay, from um, uh, uh, demography raised by uh, Professor Seike, uh, th this is a very, very serious question. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, therefore, uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, one, two years ago, Professor, uh, Prime Minister Abe pointed out we should aim at 1.8 reproduction rate. This is quite right. We have to do all the effort uh, following the case of the uh, France financial support, lifting the legal constraints, <laughs> and then having more migration. Uh, all, all of those things should be done and to reach to uh, 1.8 or so. So there's a big difference between 1.2 and 1.8. That's one thing. When young people, uh, education is more very important, but still having a high education without job is even worse. Mm. Job is more important. Job is not only a, a ways to get money, but also it gives a, a meaning of life yeah. to those people. It's your identity. This is very, very, very important. And then the reason why, despite of the economic stagnation, Japan society has been stable. But the biggest reason was that employment was guaranteed. But the other side of the coin is that Japan did not have a, a dynamic <laughs> uh, development or economy uh, because of the uh, rather uh, because employment was rather strongly uh, protected. The thirdly, uh, why nuclear was dangerous. The, who cares about uh, British nuclear or uh, French nuclear? As far as they are owned by the democratic countries where uh, the leaders have to respond to the people's opinion, that's less dangerous. But suppose Russia, if Russia uses some tactical nuclear weapons in the Middle East, will Putin lose his power? I don't think so. There might be approval, applause from the people. So now, now uh, because of his hard-line policies, uh, it was supported by the people. So it's dangerous for those countries. Russia, is all, Russia already have the nuclear weapons. But the, the uh, people in North Korea, uh, partially not knowing the result, but they are uh, supporting the nuclear armament strongly. When it comes to the, the terrorist group having nuclear weapons, this is disastrous. <laughs> this is worth, uh, worse than anything. So it really depends which country may have uh, access to nuclear weapons. This is uh, one important thing. Uh, uh, maybe that's about it. Thank you very much. Uh, I need to answer the question about Yemen. All I can tell you is that we will have a significant number of leaders and decision makers from the region, from Arab countries, from Iran also, from Israel. Uh, and we will certainly not omit uh, to talk about Yemen. We will have leaders from Human Rights Watch and Amnesty. We will have the NGO community and others to talk about uh, 
what's been going on there. And we will, of course, have representatives of those countries that are fighting a kind of a proxy war in, in, in Yemen. And I'm happy if you can give me the address of, uh, of a responsible leader whom we should invite. In addition to those many that we have already invited, I'll be happy to do that. Ladies and gentlemen, this takes us to the conclusion of our session. We need to, as I said, we need to finish in time. Some of you may want to listen to Henry Kissinger, who will be on a video link in just a few minutes, as I understand. And uh, I would like to invite our audience to give a vote of uh, thanks, a, a round of applause. Uh, to this wonderful panel. Thank you all very much. Thank you.